Had nice to talk to you, man. <laughs> well, likewise, and I'm the dullest one on this phone, so give me uh, 30 seconds on Nathan and uh, where you've been the last 50 years. Oh, well, I'm actually a, uh, a new fan myself. I'm actually only uh, 20 years old. Well, nice. Uh, well, welcome to the clan. Yeah. Most, as, as you know, most of the demographics are 55, 57, you know, 52 to 60, something like that. Yeah, I'm uh, definitely uh, in the younger crowd, yeah. And how, does, how did you come about it or bump into it or see it? Uh, well, I, when I was a kid... Uh, probably like 2009, you know, I saw they were still airing reruns of it on uh, TV. So I just just like most children in the 80s or 90s, you know, just saw some reruns and it's stuck with me ever since. Sure, uh, pretty good. Uh, it's, it's amazing. It's interesting, as the entertainment says, the kind of legs that show has. And, uh, it's pretty interesting to me. It, it, it then appeals to whole different generations as they, as they come along. What I'm just curious, I have no idea of uh, different mediums on TV. Was it one of the cable, or the, we used to call it cable, I'm not sure what they call them now, uh, like a Roku or like a Netflix, it be Netflix. Oh yeah, no, it was, uh, it was so far back in the day that yeah, it wasn't a streaming service, it was a regular uh, TV network. I forgot, I think it was like MeTV, or... Oh sure, I see, right. It was one of those, yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, yeah, I'm I'm just happy to be talking to you. This is great. Well, fire away because there's nothing out here in California. Nobody needs me here at seven o'clock. So, <laughs> well, I am uh, I am honored and I appreciate uh, your time. <laughs> sure, no, of course. And uh, well, yeah. So, um, if you want to just start, uh, where were you at in your life in uh, 1976 before uh, Land of the Lost? Yes, sir. So I was one of several USC basketball players, but I was in the third season, so I was the third group of USC basketball players that became sleek stacks, uh, along with a couple UCLA basketball players across town. Uh, David Greenwood uh, was just before me. He was a uh, UCLA player, and the interesting sidebar you might know about sleek stacks is that some of them, and most actually, uh, went on to play uh, professional basketball. Yes. John Lambert, I don't know if you've known of John before. Uh, are you aware of some of the different flea sack names necessarily? Yeah, uh, well, there's uh, I know there was uh, Cleveland Porter. Uh, he, part, he played um, in season three alongside you. And then there was also um, Bill Lambeer, I believe. Yeah, he's probably our most famous slee stack because of his Detroit Pistons. Yeah, I was going to say, I think he was the most uh, successful uh, in the NBA. Right, and number two, right behind him, would have been John Lambert that you saw in that photo. Yeah, yeah. John was a Cleveland Cavalier and a Dallas Maverick and a right with San Antonio. Uh, so he had a pretty good run, NBA run uh, as well. And then... David Greenwood went away as he was a Chicago Bull. Uh, David was the UCLA player. Um, yeah, it's so so cool that they that they uh, got you guys to do it. Yeah, uh, Cleve Porter and I were, you know, good enough to play college. Uh, you know, all of us were so-called high school All-Americans. And, you know, everybody, as you know, you, you reach certain plateaus, and so uh, college basketball was the end of the line for Cleve and I. As we say, we just wanted to get regular jobs and live happily ever after. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> uh, so I was just minding my own business uh, uh, when I got I got the call, it was sort of my turn of the USC basketball players, to say, hey, okay, um, your teammates have been doing it the last couple of years. we got this TV show that Sid and Marty Croft are producing. It's right over there in Hollywood. Uh, on, we, were, we were filming at... Uh, called the Sunset Gower Studios along Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood. Um, it was a our former Samuel Goldwyn studio. Um, and the history behind that, uh, Metro Goldwyn Mayer used to be uh, MGM, of course, one of the big, Hollywood's biggest. And 
have Sam Goldwyn spun off to have Sam Goldwyn Studios and wrapping this full circle that that's what became the Sunset Gallery Studios so for me knowing some of the Hollywood history it was pretty cool uh, to see some of those big sound stages and uh, yeah that is cool I did not know any of that uh, history about the studios and that yeah the lunch break um, you can look it up there's a great Hollywood restaurant called Formosa Cafe uh, and Formosa Cafe played a pivotal role in L.A. Confidential which is a pretty famous movie I think in the 80s or 90s um, but it was about 50s early or late 40s early 50s Hollywood not that it matters um, my point to that is that we could peel down our slee stack so if you can imagine this wetsuit we you take off our head and then you can peel this wetsuit down so you take your arms out and, and you, then it's, it's folded over so your slee stack from the waist down you're, you're a slee stack and you're a man above the waist and we walked we'd walk down Sunset Boulevard like that uh, <laughs> go to Formosa Cafe have lunch and then turn around and waddle back to uh, we couldn't walk very fast it, right more of a it, waddle it, yeah, it wasn't by accident that we just kind of shuffled our feet uh, because we weren't going to get anywhere very fast in those outfits. That's so funny. I, I think I've actually seen a behind-the-scenes photo of two slee stack. I'm not sure if it was you in the photo, but uh, there's two slee stacks that are in the halfway exactly how you described. Like, there's yeah, slee cool. stack from the bottom that, half. That black-and-white photo, I think, is Lambeer and uh, John Lambert. Yeah, yeah. There's, a, there's another one of... Me, me uh, John Locke, who was one of the talking green slee stacks, the only talking green slee stack. Yes, he gets the role of the captain slee stack, that's true. Yeah, and then Enoch, uh, so it's a pretty cool picture to have uh, Enoch, uh, John Locke, and myself were a half in that half slee stack out there. Yeah, yeah, there are some really great behind-the-scenes photos. That, well, this was one of my later questions, but since we're on the topic, I'll bring it up. There's another famous photo of uh, you holding a book, reading uh, critical <laughs> issues in, in public relations. And that has to be, like, the most legendary behind-the-scenes photo ever. And so I gotta know, what, were you actually studying critical issues in public relations, or was it a joke photo? Of course, so... So I'm glad you appreciate the gag behind that because uh, so in 76 I'd begun my master's in basketball in those days and still to this day. Uh, if you redshirt a year, meaning you, you sit out a year but you still go to school. So I came back, I was a redshirt fifth, fifth year senior, meaning I was done with my undergraduate classes so I could start my master's classes. So it kind of worked out well that even though my basketball career sucked, um, I got a master's in, in journalism. So public relations was part of the journalism sequence, they called it in those days. And I had this book that I was studying, Critical Issues, and, I, and I, it dawned on me, I thought, oh, this will be hilarious. I'm going to <laughs> ask the set photographer, I'll say, look, I got this book I'm studying. I'll say, Come over here, this part of the set. You know, like an interior of our cave or something. And, uh, and I, want to, and I, I think this photo is going to, I didn't know how how long it would last, but I said, I think this photo is going to be pretty cool to have years from now because if anyone's got an issue in public relations, it would be a sleaze bag. <laughs> so, it, so it was a gag planned by you. That is that is so amazing, and I'm so glad that we have that photo. <laughs> well, I'm glad you appreciate it. I mean, it, it really does because I, I'd like to go back in time to, the billboard of 1976 so you know you're onto something because uh whole different generations are gonna think it's pretty funny right yeah that's what i say. you were really ahead of the time in terms of uh memes right. you know right <laughs> yeah, good point that's a good point but uh yeah that that is uh that is really funny um my next thing was who actually was the one who who gave you that phone call uh who asked you about it was it a producer or um it started with one of our assistant coaches who was in touch with the assistant coaches in those days and maybe still to this day were responsible for getting us our so-called summer jobs and this now this was a sort of a spring summer gig we only shot what maybe 12 or 14 shows a season or 16 <clears throat> and so uh it was through one of the assistant 
assistant coaches, and then once I con- then I would contact the the, the Croft uh, contact uh, 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 talent coordinator, which is kind of another kind of I mean it was overkill for us to, to call us talent. It was you know everybody knew that we have no talent. In fact, that's what people ask me: What were your what what the Crofts look for? Uh, I said, well, I said literally. Someone tall with no talent, and that was that was us because you know, I had no acting talent whatsoever, and you can take direction on the set, you know, easy enough and say, okay, Bill, you're gonna, you know, come over this way, and then uh, uh, in my show, what was the uncle's name, uh, Jack? So Jack is gonna wave this uh, torch at you, and you're gonna, or something, and you're gonna fall back into the pit. So I was one of the few, maybe the only sleaze stack to ever fall into the pit. And someone sent me a clip of that, and I said, hey, this must be your fall. And what I really enjoyed about it uh, is that, you know, while you're watching on TV, and especially when you're 10 years old, you go, holy shit, uh, someone's in the pit. Well, the pit was all of four feet deep. With like a mattress at the bottom, right? Right, yeah. <laughs> and with a with fog, now the, was well, kind of, uh, too bad I didn't realize how dangerous it was, um, or at least dicey. Um, they said, okay, Bill, we fall back, take a breath, and hold your breath until we get you out of there, because you, you shouldn't be breathing the, uh, the fog, whatever that uh, fog stuff is they had in the pit. Now, at the time, I didn't realize, I, but I was you know, an athlete, so I could hold my breath no problem, but I thought, well, Jesus, if this stuff is toxic, I shouldn't be down in this thing anyway. <laughs> But uh, they were able to get me out, you know, in time. And the, I got uh, in, in AFTRA, A-F-T-R-A, AFTRA was the union for TV in those days. They've since merged, so there's no such thing now it's SAG, AFTRA. But the AFTRA contract had a provision. I got some. I got an extra 50 bucks or 100 bucks for by stunt stunt work. Ah. You know, so I, I did, I, I could actually say it was paid to be a stunt man also besides Sleestack. Because of that, yeah, that's funny. Yeah, yeah there, there's a really famous uh, scene from season one when uh, Rick, the main character, falls into the pit and uh, oh, and he his his feet, like you can you can you can basically see him like bounce yeah. on the mattress because yeah, his his feet <laughs> pop out of the smoke, yeah. So us us fans are always looking for uh, gags like that, yeah. Oh, uh, that's very funny. Of course you're ten you probably didn't know so but uh, yeah, years later you go, Oh yeah, let's look for that. Exactly, yeah. Years later we're picking apart everything, yeah. <laughs> yeah nice. Um yeah, uh, you said uh, the amount of episodes. There were uh, 13 episodes in season three and uh, the Slee stack were featured in nine out of the thirteen. Okay. Uh so what would how long would you say was like an average day of filming and how many days do you think it took to shoot those nine yeah, episodes? So, uh, that's a good question. We would shoot it took a show just about uh, five days, so it might have been a week easily. Um, you know, we would have our script, and we actually would have. Have you seen in the movies? Or t- see these those chairs on set where for the actors uh, in between scenes they have their name on the back of the chair. Yeah. Um, and so ours um, was. A high version, a tall, actually, literally, if you ever seen maybe Bill Walton uh, on TV, he's got a high, high leg stool he sits on because he's got a bad back. Well, ours were the same kind of Hollywood set chairs, except only taller so that we could sit easier with our sleeve stack legs, you know, more dangling, not having to sit in a regular chair. Anyway, point to all that is, it was kind of obvious because those are the only three the only chairs on set that were tall enough for sleeve stacks and they said sleeve stack on the back of the chair <laughs> uh, so i should have gotten someone to take a photo of the half band half sleeve stack in a sleeve stack chair but you know it wasn't that bright uh, to think of that in those days uh, right and but also you don't think about how much uh you know you don't realize 50 years later people are gonna be loving yeah. it you know <laughs> and, and uh it was really interesting to be truly a witness to history because there we were just college kids and, and we knew enough to know to, you know, to understand oh it's pretty interesting because we you know the real actors you know Wesley Beer he was on uh, daytime television Days of Our Lives I think or one of 
Yep, yep. Poppers. Uh, you know, and here real actors, and we're just, you know, we're, we'd want to stay out of the way, but we also enjoyed watching, you know, the behind the scenes, the cameraman, the, the director, the, you know, the assistant director, and then, you know, quiet on the set, and, you know, we're going, oh, shit, this is real Hollywood. Um, yeah, we knew enough to know that we knew nothing uh, about the business, uh, but being athletes, we were used to taking instruction and executing a direction, so it was like, okay, well, that's easy enough. Right, uh, right. So it was about, about five days a show, um, so that, that made sense because our, our summer jobs were usually eight to twelve weeks. Um, so it made sense that that, that was our in the old days in the NCAA you could not work during the season. You know now with NIL and name, image, likeness, and all, I mean athletes are getting just so many more dollars than we ever dreamed of back in, in the seventies. That is true. Uh, and it was our summer jobs would have to hold us over during the season if we wanted to go to a movie or McDonald's or you know, somewhere because they would pay for your room and board and books. You know, but that was it. Which, for decades, was the complaint of athletes and former athletes that you know NCAA was making millions or the university and you know we're and of course then the answer was well you're getting a hundred thousand dollar education. Well. Okay, you're right, but we're still hungry. Yeah, you still got to live out here. Yeah, especially in California. I mean, it's one thing to have that, to have your stipend, you know, make sense in, in Arkansas, but, you know, living in California is a little bit more costly. Right. Well, that uh, that leads perfectly to my uh, next question. You said you um, were paid a little bonus, uh, fifty hundred dollars uh, for a stunt. Do you remember how much you were paid just in general for your uh, time? Uh, yeah, I think it might have been I think two hundred times uh, eighteen, eighteen hundred or, or twenty two hundred sounds right for the whole for our for my, for the season I did, which might have been two hundred dollars a show maybe, and that was like minimum after union wage kind of stuff. Right. So, and that would be some guys who worked in the seven up, not like my jobs over the years were at the US, it was a seven up plant, or uh, one was a, a steel uh, uh, fabrication mill, one was a, a gravel, uh, sand and gravel yard weighing these big 70,000 uh, tra- truck and transfers, they called them in those days. Um, so we had a different job each summer, usually. Um, and the 22, 2,500 seems like about our average summer job. And then we're supposed to you know, make that last through the next nine months. Right. <laughs> you know, I wish I, you know, I wasn't smart enough either. I've seen some people, like out here in California, some have their first, or their paycheck at Disney when they worked at Disneyland back in the 60s, let's say. Um, and it'd be like, you know, $80 a week or, you know, some such Right. Yeah, no, I should have saved one of the checks stubbed or, you know, something. Or even taken a photocopy of one of my Sid Marty Croft checks. Well, that's, what I, that's what I was about to say. Uh, any Everything and anything Disney is very collectible to to uh, a, yeah. a big amount of people because it's Disney, but to a small niche of people, including myself, uh, that yeah. something like that would be extremely cool and valuable, yeah. having a an yeah. actual Land of the Lost ticket stub, yeah. But like you said, yeah, you know, yeah. hindsight. What's kind of nice, Nathan, is that, well, what I think is nice, is that uh, there still are folks like yourself each generation, because not everybody, as you know, finds historical or these kind of tidbits interesting, which I always thought was interesting, because I thought, well, it it makes it more uh, affordable to me if, 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 uh, if someone doesn't think this original Disney poster, like, well, I was just, so I had the good fortune of, Growing up uh, with the original Disneyland and when it was first built back in '55, I was only three years old. I don't remember too much of it uh, back then. But over the late '50s, early '60s, um, I, my son gave me a few reproductions of what well, used to fascinate me were these big posters that would be right at the entrance to Disneyland as you go under. In our version in Anaheim, as you go under the train, uh, the little brief, uh, the train main train stations at the entrance of Disneyland so you go on either side of it there's these two tunnels you walk through and there'd be big posters of Adventureland Tomorrowland and right then seeing those posters
college, I, I, I instinctively knew, okay, here we go. This is going to be great. And right. I'm not sure they had that in Disney World or not, but uh, Disney World is so big, I'm not sure if it quite, has quite the layout. That's uh, it's interesting, yeah. That you say that because yeah, I grew up going to Disney World my whole life, and uh, but I I recently um, this past November actually I took a trip to California and I went to uh, Disneyland and oh, nice. and uh, Universal. So I've I've been to both Universals and both Disneys. Oh, uh, good deal. Yeah. Well, I would think since you know history a bit and have an appreciation for that, I bet that was interesting to see how small. Disneyland is compared to Orlando. Very much, very much so. Yeah, I, that was the, one of the first things I noticed. Yeah, it was startling for us. We go to Disney World because, as you know, you could fit, I think, you could fit all of Disneyland here in Anaheim into the Orlando parking lot. I mean, it, it, and it, so it was massive. The scale of Disney World for us was just massive, uh, the scale that is. Um, and sure enough, we saw rides we knew and we you know, saw stuff that everyone relates to um but the size of it yeah was just startling and i to this day um we don't have grandkids yet but i'll go with young kids friends of ours um anyone who wants to go on the peter pan ride i'll go because i still will look over the side of, did they have that did they have the peter pan ride in uh, oh yeah oh yeah we got the peter pan ride over here i'll look over when that ship takes out of the, leaves the bedroom i'll look over and see the london I'll still enjoy looking down to see London to this day. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's great. I'm like very, I'm very good. Well, it's not London. <laughs> to me, it's like right back to 1957. I was going to say, yeah, it's that childhood nostalgia. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Definitely. Uh, speaking of theme parks, did you know that Sid and Marty Croft had a theme park? It was extremely short-lived. It was in Atlanta, Georgia. It was called the World of Sid and Marty Croft, and it was an entirely indoor amusement park. They, it was this like huge building that they like bought, and it was only in operation for like a year and a half or something. And uh, but yeah, uh, kids in the 70s or like early 80s, whenever it was, uh, who went to that in Georgia, have like really fond memories of it. As a, knowing what you know and having been to both. And just instinctively, you know that it's got to be so much more. And again, I'm sure even more than they bargained for. The logistics of a theme park are, are just immense. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm sure they, they've, that's why it was short lived. It's like, well, uh, no, I think we're better off uh, lending our characters to a few. You know, but I'm sure they had some agreements with other parks where they lend the craft character, whether it be Puff and Puff or stuff. What do they call yeah, puff and stuff. stuff, yeah. Or other characters, you know, to other the theme parks. Yeah, I know that they were uh, definitely in association with uh, Six Flags um, back yeah, in the day. That would make sense. Cause uh, you, do you know uh, Lidsville? Uh, which one? Lidsville. Uh, just by name. Yeah, it's another it's another crop show. Yeah, everybody is a uh, hats. Yeah, but that show, uh, the 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 intro theme song takes place. It was like shot at Six Flags, you know. Oh, sure. And I think what um, it reminds me, speaking of the Crofts, they were one of the first to use uh, the green, what we call the green screen, uh, which later now, whether it be Avatar or whatever movies, rely so much on the green screen technique of, you know, you'll, you can shoot a character, but behind, in the environment behind them is a green screen but they super, but they can superimpose any background, and that's what Sid Marycroft did in getting uh, Will and Holly and us, everybody in the land of the lost, and when the dinosaurs were behind us, they were just we didn't see anything. We always saw the green screen behind us, right? Uh, when we when we shot it, yeah, it was they were pioneers in that field. It was called uh, chroma key in the seventies. Yeah, uh, yeah, that is uh, one of the many things that made the uh, show so unique. And that was another thing I was going to say. Did you know, uh, I know you said you had heard about the show, um, you know, from other groups of your fellow uh, basketball players being asked to play it in previous years. But had you heard of it outside of that? Like, had you seen it on TV or heard people talking about it? No, we had to. That's, the, that's sort of the shame of the only downside, the only regret. I would have is that we didn't understand because we were, here we were our life's work was basketball you know we, we people like myself played uh, from being 10 years old to achieve you know some success and here we were uh, scholarship athletes playing for the schools that were some of the best in those days uh, in basketball so 
but it was just a summer job. It was, yeah, this year's summer job. You know, and, and I got stories from the 7 Up plant that are funny, or I got stories from my gravel yard days that are funny. Right. You know, the city, so Lana Ross is one more, you know, very interesting, and, and uh, Kathy Coleman, she was nice, uh, and um, Wesley was nice, and Chaka, you know, couldn't be better. You know, everyone's, uh, I forgot Chaka's name. Uh, you know, that would be uh, Philip Paley. Yeah, Philip. You know, all great people. Um, but it was like, okay, we'll see you later. Um, now, John Lambert did stay in touch uh, with Kathy a little bit, uh, and now we're back in touch with Kathy and Wes because um, there's a great show, the only show that had those characters and flea stacks was one in um, uh, Milwaukee about three years ago, three or four, maybe four years ago now. Um, and there were people that drove up, and I've got to point to the story in just a minute. Uh, there were people that drove up from Kentucky and other places all the way up to Milwaukee uh, who brought their kids. And in a panel discussion, we heard some stories of, of how important uh, Land of the Lost was. And one brought me to somewhat tears, or at least emotional, uh, when a guy was in the audience and how his parents uh, were divorcing and uh, he watch our show uh, as, the, as, a, as a, at least under, to have some family um, and could count on you know the dad or later the uncle Rick to be head of the family and you know follow their adventures and it was kind of an escape from his own pain of what his family was going through and it was quite remarkable how the, the impact and for some of these people to drive that far um, I just thought it's really what it dawned on me that I thought oh my god what an institution this was. And um, at the time, let's see, it was a summer, it was the Halloween, a year or two after I had, so the show was wrapped up. Uh, and I guess, of course, we had no more seasons after that. Um, I called up the Crofts and said, hey, look, I've uh, got uh, two young girls, a friend of ours, they're, you know, uh, uh, six and three or six and four or whatever, seven and four. Uh, I'd love to come pick up a sleeve stack, uh, my sleeve stack uh, outfit, and go walk Halloween in their neighborhood with them. Uh, and oh my God, I was the biggest hit in that neighborhood because uh, all these kids are absolutely going apeshit. That a, a real sleeve stack was actually walking down their street, and uh, our little, the, the youngest of our little friends, um, I'd walk in uh, as the sleeve stack, and she would freak, and I'd take my head off. And, oh, it's Bill. Okay, then she was fine. But as soon as I put my head back on, she couldn't connect the dots. And, hey, it's still Bill. <laughs> I Yeah, I believe I saw you um, mention that story in a Facebook uh, comment at some point. I was going to ask you about that, yeah. That is uh, awesome. That is so cool. And it's very cool that they did let you borrow it, that they were like, yeah, it's sure. Just wonderful. <laughs> just wonderful. And I think because we get so cheated nowadays, I can see where today someone wouldn't, they say, or some production company might say, no, you know, if we let it out, if something happens, and the flea is bad publicity, or, you know, whatever. Yeah, and also in the modern day, you know, uh, somebody would take a picture of you and then be like, you know, uh, make some spin about it, you know, be like, is there is there a new Land of the Lost coming or something like that, you know? But, yeah, any, all kinds of stuff. Yeah, but, and, but that, but yeah, like you said, you must have had the best costume in the neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, what I could tell was, you know, through these big eyes, as you know, you could hardly see squat anyway. But I could tell these moms and stuff because they would they saw it with their kids, and, and these moms were impressed. That it was a real sleep tech. Yeah, well, I'm sure compared to your average uh, store bought costume, <laughs> it was uh, extremely high quality. You know, professional well, made. And it's uh, it was lost on us because we were just we were in it, so we never really understood how tall we were. But if I'm six seven, uh, of course I was one of the shortest sleeve stacks because John and everybody's six ten. Um, and then you stand on the boots. Yeah, so those boots would have to be six five six inches. And then you have a spike on your head. Uh, yeah. So we were, we here I am. I was fine. 
five or seven feet, whatever I wanted to be. Yeah, probably, definitely. I was gonna say upwards of seven feet. Yeah, that's why they really, they really did a great job at at making them uh, menacing because that's exactly what uh, what David Gerald was going for, the the inventor of the slee stacks, when he when he thought him up, and that was why he he wanted to get specifically basketball players because he knew they would be like sure. seven feet tall when it was all said and done. And someone like yourself, uh, who knows them so well, you can tell when someone's done a knockoff of a sleeve stack. Cause there's, there's something about the, the head design, the proportion. And we all know what a real sleeve stack head looks like and what a bogus one looks like. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's pretty interesting to me that they got it so right, or at least a, a design that is unique to real sleeve stacks. Yeah, and that that was another thing I was going to ask you. Uh, how was the the process of getting in and out of the of the suit like? Did you require assistance? Because I know it was yeah. I know it was a wet suit. Uh, yeah, it was just a colossal. Uh, well, not colossal. It was. It did take time. It did take some help. Um, we could get. I recall we get the boots on ourselves. These these a big uh, work boot with elevator with the big heels on them. Yeah, we get those on okay. I guess the wetsuit, we put our legs in first, no big deal. We did have help getting the arms in and up and over our shoulders. They would zip uh, from the back uh, and this, put the, so Velcro, they'd zip us up and put the Velcro spine over it. And the head, then they would help uh, put it up and over and, and on us. And the eyes were such that we had this mesh um, that we could see through. Uh, uh, it's probably not visible. Uh, they did a good job of, I think, you know, if we imagine a sleeve stack eye, it's kind of a glass, black, you know, can't really tell much definition in it. Fortunately, from the inside, it was a, we saw a black mesh uh, that we could see through. Um, the most, the grossest thing about it, that fortunately no one talks about because that's just gross. The sweat. Exactly. Maybe someone else mentioned it. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, literally, and I just unbelievably just imagine this, we might pour out of our boots like a cup of water or uh, two cups of water. I mean, it was unbelievable how much water collected in these boots uh, being on set in these in these wetsuits. Well, it made worse by the fact that most wetsuits, if you know wetsuits, they can breathe because they, they might keep you warm in the water, but, but they're porous. Um, so when you put the, the green plaster, the, uh, plastic, whatever the f uh, material was over a sweatsuit, now there's zero breathing whatsoever of the material. Right. It's just going to collect. Yeah. So it's, yeah, one place to go is down to our boots. <laughs> that's, that's exactly what, uh, Walker Edmondson said in his interview. Uh, that's, that's how I, that's how I knew that you were going to bring up the sweat. Cause he said he would, he would take off his glove and pour his arm and he could like pour, pour a cup out of his arm. And he would, that was, I'm glad you know of Walker or that there've been interviews with him because he is and was as nice as he appears in his interviews. Um, what, what I thought was so funny is he was so dramatic uh, in the lines they gave him. Um, and I know as you probably read that, that we were, in those days, we were also paralleling and mimicking some of the Star Trek um, writers. And I guess some of the writers were the same. Um, they would write for both Land of the Lost and Star Trek. Yeah, a lot in the earlier seasons. And he was our, and, he, and Enid, of course, was our Spock. Um, and but he, he was so dramatic in his uh, delivery and uh, about what, what is not logical and you know kind of and we all turned as you as you notice when we turned no one ever turns their head you turn your shoulders you you turn your whole upper body turns <laughs> that, yeah we were gonna turn our head around like what uh, we could sort of move your shoulders your shoulders had to be pointing with, with your head. Um, so that stuff isn't by, I mean, it, it, not by accident that we had those motions, which kind of worked to the, 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 to, the, to their end in that that's also what made sea stacks a little different in that we had a certain movement, uh, but it was 100% just because the outfit was made that way in the first place. Uh, and our, you can just see how, think about how sleeve stacks walk those hands to the side uh, and sort of bent elbow bent and the shuffling back and forth it 
was sort of easier because you never see, you know, as you think about fleas, you never really see them picking up their feet, you know, walking like normal folks. Um, it was always most of that slide stuff. That slee stack easier. shuffle. Yeah, it's just easier in that uh, outfit. And you probably know, since you know a lot about this stuff, um, we never heard what we sounded like. All of that was always dubbed over. So the, the, the people said, can you still make the sleeve deck sound? I, and I, at this point, a few folks, I'm sure, in Milwaukee say, well, we never made a sound. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all that, you hear, uh, what you would hear off camera and, and start to get anxious, like, oh, shit, there's sleeve stacks in the area. Um, you know, we couldn't hear on set. Right, yeah, I've wondered, I've often wondered how they how they made that sound, if it was just a guy making the noise, but... uh. Yeah. But yeah, to me, it was definitely in a sound effects lab or studio that, because uh, you and I can hear it in our heads. I don't know how to. It kind of it kind of sounds like a pressure valve, like yeah, it's right. like but like. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So you know, I was <laughs> to do that in the show. So I'm sorry. <laughs> I can I can try and give it a shot, but it's not the real sleep stack. Right, yeah. People people might think that because, um, you know, Walker Edmondson actually, he was the only, out of the Slee Stack, uh, Enoch was the only one that actually did do live, like, like his, his lines were recorded in the thing because he had a, um, he had a microphone set up where there was a little mic like taped on his nose, down the bridge of his nose, you know? So, uh, so he was able to actually give his lines because you know Enoch was talking all the time. He had to actually give his lines, and if they they made the interesting decision to not uh, dub over his lines. They were recorded like live in the scene. Do you remember recall what was the story behind the why John Locke? Why could a green all of a sudden one of the green sleeve stacks could talk? Uh, yeah, well. There wasn't there wasn't an there wasn't really an in universe reason given. It was because uh, season three just came with a, a lot of changes. You know, season if you if you look at the original series, it's really season one and two, and then season three because like the biggest reason was uh, a bunch of the writers changed, so the overall tone of the season is a lot different. And the biggest thing being they made the Slee stack more uh, offensive with their attacking. And they decide, and they decided to make one of the Slee Stack be the Slee Stack leader, and they decided to make right. him able to talk, and that was John Locke. Yeah. Well, they all took it so so uh, seriously, and, and John is, is almost Shakespearean type. <laughs> <laughs> you can you can tell. Yeah, I thought to myself, "Oh my God, guys, you have a lizard outfit on. This is not Shakespeare." <laughs> They like their craft and they do a good job of their work. Uh, speaking of just more active, um, did you ever see? I think there's a famous clip. Our, our bow and arrows were the world's worst bow and arrow <laughs> of all time because I, I think I saw it and I, I knew I saw it on set, but I didn't know if they captured it. There was a clip where one of the sleeve stacks shoots this crossbow or bow and arrow, whatever we had, and the bow. Oh, sorry, the arrow actually went end over end. <laughs> and it was just, I remember giggling on the set thing. oh, geez, these things suck. These aren't going to hurt anybody. But if you're five or seven years old, you're going, uh-oh. You're going, oh, God, God they're just shooting them, yeah. Now they got a crossbow. Now we're really screwed. That that is, uh, yeah, they, they, that, they look more like, uh, like slingshots made for, like, kids, yeah. Oh, God, they were awful. <laughs> And it, it's a common joke amongst fans how uh, terrible shot the Slee Stack are. You know, they're 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 like stormtroopers. <laughs> yeah, that's very that's very true. Uh, well, in fairness to us, there was bad equipment. We would have been better shot if we had better equipment. Right. Someone give us some uh, some good crossbows, maybe. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus, we're athletes for God's sake. We know what we're doing. Just decent, decent equipment. <laughs> Well, yeah, uh, you all, you already kind of touched on uh, this question. I was going to say, um, how are your relationships like with the main cast, like uh, Wesley and Kathy, and uh, Uncle Jack was played by Ron Harper? Yeah, they, uh, to say the word indulged us might sound too uh, disconnected. They were very polite, uh, very respectful. We just didn't have, and I think I made it worse by not 
wanting to intrude on their time, meaning I, I didn't go out of my way to, you know, do much the same. I still didn't want to be, you know, we knew we were pretenders. We, you know, we were just basketball players uh, putting on this green wetsuit. Right. Um, and these, these were real people having real jobs, doing real stuff. And, and you know, it, it wasn't too different than when I was a show up at, a, at the steel uh, fabrication plant where these, you know, union guys are, this is what they do for 40 years in a steel fabrication. There wasn't a steel mill per se. So we weren't manufacturing steel, but we were assembling and, and for distribution different cold rolled steel, they call them, putting on trucks. And so these are guys who have been doing this for 40 years. And, I'm, you know, we're coming in as 20 year old kids like, hi, here we are for the summer. How are you? All right. <laughs> so we we're always respectful that we were coming in to situations that were real careers for other people. Um, so I think having that in my mind, I wasn't as outgoing as I would have liked, should have been, or could have been. Uh, John Lambert was, and that's why he and Kathy stayed in touch uh, over the years. Um, and John Quincinelli was in the photo I sent you a little while ago. Yeah, that's so um, cool that you guys uh, that you guys happened to be yeah. uh, getting getting together right when I uh, started talking to you. Yeah, um, but I really am blessed that. Uh, for the Milwaukee show, and I keep mentioning that because it's the only, I've done two shows. Uh, they don't get, you know, and, and understandably so, sleep stacks don't show up to many shows because no one really, I mean, when I say no one cares, meaning that no one really connects the dots that, oh, that's a sleep stack. Right, I mean, it's harder for people, your face wasn't on screen, you know, so. Right, if it wasn't for the credits, I mean, who, who the hell knows who's in that mask? <laughs> hey, if, yeah. uh, there are a lot of things from, from the 70s and you know early media like that where where the people weren't credited where we don't know who the people inside of the masks are you know so uh yeah it's we are uh lucky to know that information and i've got something somewhere when someone sent me a, a youtube of, a, of one of our shows on season three and uh i actually took a, took a screenshot of you know bill boyd Cleve, cleveland porter um we show up on one of the credits, one of the, as a screen to ourselves, which uh, was like, oh, okay, take a screenshot of that. Uh, you know, there I am. Yeah, yeah, the Crofts were good about uh, giving credit to the uh, to the because because uh, a lot of Croft shows featured people in full body costume, you know, like Puff and stuff right. and all that. So yeah, they were they were better than a lot of people back then about giving credit. And so getting to see uh, Wes and Kathy. Uh, and uh, Philip in those at, at that show, and then uh, weren't, and then we stayed in touch. And, and Philip had a fascinating hobby. Um, I got to talk to him. About, well, I guess I only started talking to him after I was on Facebook and saw that he would raise some caterpillars into these gorgeous monarch butterflies. Um, and I, I told him that is the most eclectic, interesting hobby I've ever seen. Um, and it was just fantastic. I mean, so getting to know, and he's a, a paralegal in Century City. It's a part of Los Angeles out here. Um, you know, they're all living normal lives. Wesley, uh, I guess Wes and uh, Kathy do quite a bit, uh, a little more than Philip, uh, getting out to different shows around the country. Have they been through Florida? Have you met them? Uh, they have. I don't believe they've had a convention in Florida. Most of most of the conventions are in the uh, are in the West Coast, but uh, a lot of it is uh, like fans doing the legwork. Like I've seen, you know, I follow all of them closely. So Wesley like asks us fans to uh, reach out to promoters to uh, yeah. try to set stuff up, you know. And so I've done that with multiple different uh, Florida promoters because. I know that if I know that if they came, uh, people would come. I know that there's a big, uh, big uh, support down here. You know, for lots, lots of people, yeah. lots of people that loved uh, '70s TV. Yeah, but uh, it would seem it would seem a good idea in in populated like Florida. I mean, you, you and I instinctively just know that. Well, we probably wouldn't have it in Montana because there's just the, the population density is so you know sparse. But you know, Florida. Uh, any of those big population states who have, and the demographics are pretty interesting that it's going to be people, the original watchers, and then the decades after that of everyone who stumbles into it. Exactly, like me, yeah, I'm a second generation uh, watcher. Well, it might be, if we, if we did the math, it could be, it might be a third or fourth generation. 
Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, but you said you had been to uh, two conventions before. Yeah. So the the um, Milwaukee one. Uh, no, uh, so the Milwaukee. There's one in L.A. that we did, and those are the only two official ones. Um, I went to, out to Vegas to say hi to Kathy and Wes once. They, they did a Star Trek uh, convention and were there as a side booth, and I just saw them at a separate reception they had at a local restaurant um, for Land of the Lost you know types um, but it's, uh, they, they uh, couldn't have been any nicer and uh, it's really a it's, it's fun as uh, we had dinner uh, out there in Milwaukee after one night of the show and I said it's really too bad it's kind of fun though after 50 years no no not quite yet 50 years um, 45 whatever it was to all those decades ago, and I'll be back to you. Yeah, that's cool uh, that you've gotten to meet them. Yeah, I definitely need to make a pilgrimage uh, to a to a cast meetup soon. That will uh, that will be great because they're they're oh, they're so nice. So it's so cool it. how much they're uh, connected. And especially since you know so much about it, there, there's some it would be lost on some who don't know as much as you do. So this big pretty wide swing of of fans that casually say, "Oh yeah, I watched it once," or folks like yourself that that are going to know more than most about the show. Right, yeah, I'm definitely, uh, I, I, I like to think I'm in the uh, top percentile in terms of uh, obsessed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I ain't glad on my way. I'm happy to do it because uh, I'm going to find, I got, there's some things that Milwaukee show printed that I'll send to you that were like a playing card of, of sleeve stacks. Uh, or no, I say, I mean, uh, like a baseball card, uh, whatever kind of souvenir card I'm trying to say. Oh, is it the uh, the one where it's a uh, the is it the the little baseball card of of yes. uh, the picture of, the picture of you holding the book? Yeah, do you have those? And and you signed it. Yeah. I I don't have that particular one, but uh, the person who did that he 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 got like like hundreds of them, and he got all of the cast members to sign them, and then he to sell all of them. Which is really cool because it, it's like their their land of the lost trading cards. So so I have I have one that's signed by Wesley Year, Kathy Coleman, and Spencer Milligan, who played Rick in seasons one oh, and two. Nice. So it's signed by all three so of them. Yeah. Oh, that's great! And it was so nice that Spencer was able to do the Milwaukee show because he doesn't do shows. That that was a big big deal. Exactly. I'm really in real life something completely <laughs> after the commercial real estate guy. Uh, with two kids and a little white dog that right, uh, just you just you're just you know, just a guy that was a, that was a slee stack. <laughs> so it's always fun to take the time and go out of my way to do this stuff because you know it means a lot to folks like yourself. Um, so I'm happy to do it. So yeah, well, it def definitely means the world is, to me. Well, I'm, that's why I'm happy to do it. Oh, I was going to tell you, it, it it's not lost on us. So we didn't know. Um, in season three, we just knew that here we were showing up being sleaze stacks. And it wasn't until later, and, and like the Milwaukee show, and when we started hearing about the differences between the, the not even Kathy herself liked uh, season three. I mean, she didn't like... Yeah. And that was part of the problem. They loved Spencer, so it didn't matter if God himself was going to be Uncle Jack. Um, they weren't going to like him. Right, yeah. And we had no idea that the writing uh, sucked compared to the first season one and two, um, and sucked is too critical. But that no sucks. no that is no that is a that is not too critical. <laughs> coming coming <laughs> coming from a land of the lost fan, uh, that is the uh, majority majority opinion of of season three. Yeah, because that because you know they they. They stopped working with Spencer because uh, of disagreements on on payments of uh, about merchandising. You know, Spencer thought that he yeah. should he should get paid for his face being on a lunchbox, which is fair. Sure. Even if, but even if Spencer would have stayed, uh, the writing still would have been still would have been really bad because uh, the thing that made the show what it was was the amazing cast of writers. And like you said earlier, uh, the large majority of the writers had science fiction work already under their belt like the original Star Trek series. That was the writers yeah. for season one and two. So yeah, it was a, a combination of the lack of writers and a lack of Spencer Milligan for the season three. Yeah. And so it became one of uh, 
now we're kind of sheepish about it in a way that because now I know the difference between oh you were season three <laughs> versus, <laughs> versus season one and two. I used to think we're all one big happy sleep stack family, but now yeah. it's like oh yeah, you there's and Clee were in season three. Okay. There's a there's a little bit of a line there, but no, <laughs> but but no, to still be part of that history is still amazing. Yeah, because the more I think about it, and those. Some of those shows were memorable because they were so odd to me being on set because whether it be the abominable snowman or the or the guy that lands in the balloon or some 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 weird you know uh, script writing that I thought oh that's kind of interesting <laughs> uh, not not realizing it was so radically different than you know, previous because none of us I the other thing too none of us watched the show we had no idea uh, right we were, we were in college you know so we're in college you're not about to get up Saturday morning and watch, you know, a kid's show. Um, and it just never dawned on us that, hey, we could, we could be watching the show as well. We, we just Yeah, and that's interesting because it was so successful, the show, but it does make sense that you wouldn't have seen it because uh, you were in college, like you said. But one of the first moments that you realized how popular it was must have been that Halloween, right? Yeah, yeah good point. Yep, yep. And then later in years, as people – and then I – a big hit in different business meetings over the years. I figured I kind of read the, the crowd of the, who I was with. I'm kind of about 10 years or so younger than me. And I said, Hey, did you watch Leo Lost going up? Oh boy, did I? Oh, I love that show. My favorite show. I said, Remember those uh, tall green, uh, they go, Slee Stacks? I go, Yeah. <laughs> and I say, Well, I was a Slee Stack. No way. No, no way. So, yeah, yeah. Then there's been like three decades of, of clients. Of different ages that I've sent them that same uh, black and white uh, critical issues and public relations. <laughs> photo. That is, that is, I, I, I give you the crown. You have the best behind the scenes photo. <laughs> it's so well, good. That's good to know. I, that does, at least I made my mark somewhere in the, in the uh, <laughs> fandom. That, that is a known photo. Like, oh, that's a pretty cool behind the scenes photo. And for you to be able to say, yeah, that one's me. That's great. Yeah. Right, right. Did you get to keep any uh, props from the show? No, and, and they were nice enough. I'm sure they could have, especially last season. Um, I mean, they were probably uh, giving it away, yeah. And they were, they were such a decent well, operation. I'm sure they would have. And, but I was so naive, you know, I wouldn't even know. Hey, Bill, you got to see if you can, you know, ask for this or ask for that. Right, at the time, you someone's, don't think. Someone's told me there's still... I think one of the surviving Slee Stack outfits is in one of the Croft offices or headquarters or somewhere. There's a... There were only three made, and then the Enix suit, so technically four if you count the Enix suit. But uh, only, yeah, uh, two survive into the modern era. Uh, there was three. The third one uh, was believed to have been destroyed after it was. There, one of them was used in an episode of the A Team in. Uh, oh. In like 1984, uh, they used a sleeve stack yeah. suit in that episode, and it's believed to have been destroyed after its use in that episode because of damage uh, it, it took. And then the other two were in storage for the next like three decades, and then they uh, they were both restored by a guy named Rob Klein who works with the Crofts. And yeah, one of these surviving sleeve stack suits is in his personal collection, and one of them uh, and one of them is in the Crofts office uh, on oh, nice. on display. Yeah. Well, it's, it's nice that people know where those are. That's good. Uh, we, and that was about, uh, I'm not kidding, yeah, we were, so I was, I was about 220 pounds then, 215, and now uh, 260, uh, no, 250, what the hell am I, 230, no, 230, so 240. Well, anyway, the point is about 20 pounds ago, or 30 pounds ago. <clears throat> so a lot of us, it'd be a bit snug to put those back on. Right, yeah. If you had to reprise your roles, do you think? Uh, do you think if there was a new, um, if there was a new Land of the Lost production and uh, you were called upon, would you be? Uh, would you be down to get back in the suit? You know, we'd enjoy it, but <clears throat> but you know, here, here's when I say this out loud, it's gonna make reality right smack in my face. <clears throat> I'm 70 years old, <laughs> so <laughs> every at some point, all of us grow up. <laughs> <laughs> there's gotta be there's gotta be somebody 25 or 20 like i was 
or 23 that would fit better, move better, you know, with, <laughs> with my mobility. Well, I guess I, uh, I could still make the sleep stack shuffle, but um, it, it'd be nice just to be asked on set just as alumni, which is a, kind of the heartbreaking thing about how bad the, the Land of Lost movie was. Um, it's just shocking. I don't know if you ever saw it. That's what I was, I was going to ask you. Had, have you seen it? No, and I think they missed such – there's such a market they missed, um, which I knew they were trying to go for because they knew that it was a big hit and, and still popular, but it was done so poorly. I'm just startled at how the, the writing and not to include – I guess they did have Kathy and Will in some cameo scenes, but those were cut. And the cameo uh, scene got deleted. It didn't even make it, yeah. It's just awful. Just just awful yeah it was really it was really bad uh yeah they uh so to, to say out loud that these sleep stacks are now all 70 years old was like oh my god that's ancient <laughs> history uh but it'd be nice to be asked on that's why we, get, we enjoy showing up at you know shows and stuff whenever asked a few times um but it's it's been a it's a fun part of our culture especially especially out here in hollywood um to have been a part of it, uh, which it did lead to. Like I had my after card, and I did other a Dick Clark special and a Captain to the other different shows that were literally they needed someone tall with no talent. As I was gonna, I was gonna say, did the Crofts ever um, need you for any tall work again? But uh, or or or, but it seems uh, some other some other people did. Uh, well, no, but uh, you know, as a, a super fan of. of I mean, uh, Land of Lost Lore, uh, uh, we did work one of uh, Marty's uh, parties, and so a couple of sleeve stacks, we valeted cars. <laughs> not, not in our uniform, not, not as sleeve stacks, just as you know, normal folk. Oh, really? I, I, uh, I didn't know this. When was this party? Uh, probably 77. Sorry, it was about the same time, you know. Right after, right after Land of the Lost ended? Yeah. And they need a few guys to park cars. They go, hey, let's call a couple of our sleep stacks. Yeah, that that's uh that's funny, yeah. Um, and also, was it was it the uh, it was the Halloween of '77 when uh you uh, uh, borrowed it? Let's uh, let's be specific. So I was uh, no, so it was seventy Halloween of '78. Right, I was gonna say if uh, not '77, it must be '78. Yeah, if it was just it was uh, right after. 70, uh, uh, because I know that I was living in. Uh, Manhattan Beach, my wife, who just gotten married in September, uh, so that October, and we said, hey, maybe our flower girls, because these girls were our flower girls at our wedding, uh, maybe we'd like to uh, trick or treat with a sleeve stack. So it was a big surprise to them. They had no idea. I, my wife rings their doorbell, and I show up in the doorway, and, and the one freaked, and the other one thought it was pretty cool. <laughs> um, and the one, the young one, and when I took my head off, you know, she was fine, like I said, and then, so even though I was in the same living room, I put my head back on and she went ape shit again. <laughs> so, hey, those Slee stack are uh, creepy though. And yeah, I have I haven't seen the uh, the movie either. It's uh, it's something I I want to watch the movie and like film my reaction, you know, because yeah, I because I know I'm gonna be so disappointed about it. <laughs> yeah, and I purposely that's why I, I don't because I don't want to. I just I'm just sorry that it's out there and I didn't, don't even want to give it the acknowledgement of, of watching it the, you know it's just right yeah but i know i keep saying this but you're one demographic and you got two or three other generations ahead of you uh we've been fun to talk to but yeah uh yeah thank you so much uh for your time thanks for your time it's always i really appreciate your time i'm glad there are folks out there like yourself oh yeah man and thank you so much again i cannot tell you how much you uh made made a young fan's dream come true <laughs> Uh, very good. Anytime you think of something or need something, always let me know. Not a problem. All right. Thank you so much, man. You have a, have a great one. Talk to you again. Thanks.